Hi class, uh, welcome back. And also welcome to the new uh, online version of this poetry class. I'm gonna be preparing a series of online lectures and discussions. I'm very excited because I've actually been able to um, confirm that Jay Sheets, Meg Wade, and Joe Kane will be participating in an online discussion lecture series with us this semester. So maybe that's like a way that we can look at the pandemic from a positive perspective, if we even really want to go that far. Uh, um, anyway, it's been a really crazy couple of weeks. And I thought that the first thing that I should do is try and just be honest with you. Um, and, you know, I know that some of you are facing some really trying times. I know that um, service workers don't really know what they're going to do. I know that, you know, so many changes keep happening so quickly that we don't even really know or understand the significance of everything that's going on right now. I know that um, I myself have been hospitalized twice for asthma attacks as an adult. Um, and that makes me one of these people that may be high risk. So it's a scary time. Um, and I don't know, you know, part of me doesn't really know if I believe everything that I'm hearing. And then the other part of me wants to make sure that um, I'm taking precautions and being safe especially for the people that I love who might even be in a worse place than I am. But it is a great time for poetry. <laughs> it's a great time to remind ourselves of how powerful and beautiful literature is because Right now, that's, that might be all that some of us have, you know, and I don't know. I don't know where things are gonna go. I don't know what this means, but I do know that times like these are when we need artists and thinkers and poets and, you know, the new perspective more than ever. But I want you to know that I'm still going to be here for you as much as I can, can be. And that um, I wish we could have finished the class together the way that we started it. But I am glad that this has been a step that we're taking to make sure everybody is safe. So anyway, maybe we should move on. But I felt it was important for me to first be honest with you. So there we go to poetry. Elements of poetry, tone, and mood. So we've made it about halfway through this lecture already. So I'm going to be skipping over some of what we've discussed. I am glad that we're coming back to some of this because your essay two is going to be a tone and mood analysis. Most, almost all of you are doing a creative project except for one. So again, you know, this time where we're being forced to isolate, it's good because you can take that time and have forced introspection. Uh, tone, tone is simply the author's attitude toward the subject. 
You can recognize the tone slash attitude of the language slash word choice the author uses. Their language will reveal their perspective, opinion. That is whether it is positive or negative about the subject. A tone must be inferred through the use of descriptive words. Right, so that's just how the author feels about his subject and how the author is approaching her subject. Mood, this is the climate or the experience or the feeling, the emotional impact uh, that the poem has on the reader, right? So the climate of, the, of feeling in literary work, the choice of setting objects, details, images, and words all contribute towards creating a specific mood. So we did this in class. <clears throat> So now let's look at analyzing mood and tone in poetry. How awkward when they when playing with glue. How awkward when playing with glue can suddenly find out that you have stuck nice and tight your left hand to your right in a permanent how do you do. So we know that this this is a playful tone, right? Because this is a limerick. So first off we can use form to analyze tone. Um, and in a sense, even if we contradict what is traditionally being communicated with form, we, we even if we use, uh, even if our mood or tone contradicts with what is traditionally used or displayed in the form or, or the, blah, blah, blah. Even if our, we contradict or do something different from what is traditionally used or explored within a specific form, that's okay. That means that we're just allowing tone to still form, to still communicate something, but we're not being bound solely by the form. Instead, we're reimagining form. And that's really, that's a big thing that we're seeing being played with right now in poetry. But a limerick is a short, fixed verse that's often humorous. Um, so the tone of this poem is, poem is clearly humorous, playful, and lighthearted. Body, right? That's a great word. Howl who hiccuped endlessly, who hiccuped endlessly trying to giggle, but wound up with a sob behind partially, oops, make myself a little smaller. who hiccuped endlessly trying to giggle, but wound up with a sob behind a partition in a Turkish bath, and the blonde naked angel came to pierce them with a sword, who lost their, lover, their love boys to the three old shrews of fate, the one-eyed shrew of the heterosexual dollar, the one-eyed shrew that winks out the womb, and the one-eyed shrew that does nothing but sit on her ass and sniff the intellectual golden threads of the craftsman's loom. Who copulated ecstatic and insatiated, insatiate with a bottle of beer and a sweetheart, a pack and a, and a beer, a sweetheart package of cigarettes and a candle and fell off the bed and continued along the floor and down the hall and ended fainting on the wall with a vision of ultimate cunt and cum eluding the last jism of consciousness. Who sweetened the snatches of a million girls trembling in the sunset and were red eyed in the morning but prepared to sweeten the snatch of the sunrise flashing buttocks under barns and naked in the lake. 
uh, this tone, we can argue this is an excerpt from Howell section one and it's commanding, outraged, mourning, grave, mournful, hopeless, bitter, blunt, sentimental, compassionate, you know? And we see that we're seeing who lost lover boys, love boys to the three old truths of fate, uh, who lost, you know, that's that compassion, who hiccuped endlessly trying to giggle but wound up with a sob. You know? Again, there's the tone in the section of the poem of Howell that it's so much so just about who has been left out, who has been lost, who has been denied, who sweetened the snatches of a million girls trembling in the sunset. You know, he's playing with double entendre. His word choice is very purposeful. Um, I would definitely argue that nothing that Ginsburg is including in this is accidental. Instead, it's all being used to create that sensation mood is restless, rejected, heartbroken, nightmarish, painful, sick, and somber. Hip-hop gozzle. Gotta love us brown girls munching on fat, swinging blue hips. Decked out in shells and splashes Lottie, bringing them woo hips. As the jukebox teases, watch my sister's throat, the heartbreak inhaling bass line, crackling backbone and singing through hips. Like something boneless, we glide silent, seeping tween floorboards, wrapping around the hymns, and ooh-wee, clinging like glue hips. Engine grinding, rotating, smoking, gotta pull back some natural minds I lost at the mere sight of ringing true hips. Gotta love us brown, gotta love us girls, just strutting down Manhattan streets, killing men folk with a dose of that stinging view, hips. Crying about getting old, Patricia, you need to get off what God gave you. Say a prayer and start slinging Q-hips. So the tone in this poem is affectionate, playful, reassuring, commanding, direct, self-assured, proud. Uh, there's a sense, again, of reclaiming, right? Uh, and praising of the naturalness of one's body. Excited, content, jubilant, determined, vivacious, liberating. And so what's interesting about this uh, is that there is a sort of tension between form and tone, right? Uh, where traditionally we see the chazel, chazel, there we go, <laughs> or the gazel, uh, is being used for mournful purposes or for sort of religious, it's, there's a sort of religious tone to them. Um, and so while we're seeing the gozzle here, the gozzle is not mournful. The gozzle is not apologetic, right? Instead, the gozzle is being used as a way of waking us out of our complacency. You thought that I should be sad. You thought that I should be ashamed when really I know the power and the significance of my body. When really I see, right, the speaker sees the beauty of her body. And that even though it's sort of not traditionally what we would, what we would assume as beautiful or what, uh, not what we, that's a bad word choice, but not what, previous generations perceived beauty to be. Now we're celebrating ourselves. We're reclaiming ourselves. We're seeing ourselves. This is beautiful poem. Duende by Jack Gilbert. I can't remember her name. 
It's not as though I've been in bed with that many women. The truth is, I can't even remember her face. I know, uh, I kind of know how strong her thighs were in her beauty. But what I can't forget is the way she tore open the barbecue chicken with her hands and wiped the breath, the, the grease on her breasts. Such a, such an intimate and almost strangely misleading poem. If we begin at the first line, I can't remember her name. And you're, you sit back and you're like, oh great, this is gonna be another poem about you know, some guy who likes to snag all these different ladies. And then you get into, it's not as though I've been to bed with that many women. Instead, we see that it's more detachment. It's not so much about the glorifying of this experience, but instead about maybe the, the boredom and the mundanity that our speaker is experiencing. The tone is affectionate, playful, sensational, sensual, lively. I, lively has been suggested by a few students, and I sometimes debate that one. Uh, admiring, appreciative, inflammatory, evocative, romantic, and detached. Mood is flirtatious relaxed, rejuvenated, numb, and sensation, sentimental. Definitely numb and sentimental. And flirtatious, right? What, what makes him remember her is the break from the ordinary. That's that carnal heat, almost. That abandonment of decorum. Oh, beautiful poem. Elements of poetry. So now let's look at medium, right? Because, you know, we've talked a lot about how poetry is a form of art, right? And we have to now sort of look at, just like we would admire with a painting, we have to look at uh, how the poet is using their medium. And their medium is language but there's so much that we could do with language, especially in how we would create a sense or create a exploration in the poem. This is a great quote by Mark Twain, and it's so true, right? The difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between the lightning bug, the lightning and the lightning bug right where if you if once you get that right word once you find what the poem is trying to say or once you get out of the way of what the poem is trying to do almost and you allow or you discover that language the correct language oh that's what creates a beautiful poem um diction is the study and analysis of how a writer uses language for distinct purposes and effects, including word choice and figures of speech. So we're gonna be looking at uh, different elements that we could consider. When analyzing diction, consider such questions as, is the language concrete or abstract? Are the words monosyllabic or polysyllabic? Do the words have interesting connotations? Is the diction formal or colloquial or conversational? Is there any change in the level of diction in the passage? Is there a shift? What can the reader infer about the speaker or the speaker's attitude from the word choice? So ways of characterizing diction. We have abstract, which is not material, re representing a thought, pleasant tasting, right? Uh, not material. Um, in other words, love is a very abstract concept. 
Love is a very abstract word. Hate is a very abstract concept. We can never hold hate. We can never really hold love in our hands. And so something that we'll often do is that we'll use the abstract, we'll use the concrete to sort of uh, give presence to abstract notions or abstract feelings so that then they become something tangible. So then we can hold them, we can feel them, we can touch them. A concrete is real or actual, right? An apple. I can understand what an apple is. Uh, specific, not general, sour tasting, right? A pleasant tasting. What does pleasant taste like, right? I don't know. And maybe what is pleasant tasting to me isn't pleasant tasting to you. But I, I know, I can understand without a doubt what sour tasting is, right? Immediately when I hear sour tasting, I, I, I see lemons, I see sour candies. My husband loves sour candies. Oh my God, it drives me crazy. Um, uh, vinegar, right? There's all this sort of sense of sour. But pleasant tasting for me, I might, I might think of, I mean, I love pickles an unhealthy amount. And so I might think of a pickle, right? But then my, 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 best friend's partner hates them. So when he hears pleasant, he's not going to think of pickles. So again, it's not material. It's not physical. It's not fixed. So we use the concrete to help bring understanding to the abstract. Does the passage use figures of speech? Does the passage use unusual images or patterns of imagery? Does the author create analogies? like similes or metaphors? Does the author use personification? Is there deliberate hyperbole or understatement in the passage? Does the author employ paradox or oxymoron to add complexity? Um, what, parts of part, what, part, what parts do Rhythm, oh, what part do rhythm and sound devices such as alliteration, onomatopoeia, play in the passage? And what purpose do the figures of speech serve? And what effect do they have on the passage? So this is a list of rhetorical terms that you can look at. Uh, and we're going to look at some of them. But again, if you're curious, you can feel free to come back to this list and look through, you know, or start investigating for yourself um, what these different rhetorical terms can do and how they work within poetry. Uh, alliteration. Alliteration is the occurrence of the same letter or sound at the beginning of an adjacent or closely connected word, right? So here's an example. Taste treats till time is tangible. Uh, one that we've talked about a lot from Whitman, mystical moist night air, right? That it adds that pattern, right? It adds that sort of sense. I like to always say a sense of a rhyme without the rhyme, that you can tell that the author is doing something very purposeful with sound and that sound is being used to draw attention to the line. So alliteration is one that is a figure of speech that I'm very familiar with and that I have a, sorry, is, yeah, sorry, I hiccuped. Um, there's also something that I use a lot in my own po poetry personally. Repetition is a literary device that repeats the same words or phrases a few times to make an idea clearer um, and more memorable. As a rhetorical device, it could be a word or a phrase or a full sentence or a po poetical line repeated to emphasize its significance to, in the entire text, right? So we see that in Howell, we have the, a lot of different phrases repeated over and over again. Section two, Moloch, Moloch, Moloch. Uh, I'm with you in Rockland in section three. And he's using repetition to ground the reader so that there's an understanding of what, um, oh, there's not an understanding, but there's a sense that we can hang on to because there's a familiarity in the phrase, right? 
it gives us that sort of sense of familiarity without um, having to use something that's typical, right? Ways to characterize diction. <laughs> oh, we have formal, which is academic or literary writing, germ, relatives, position, child, superior, communicate. Um, and then informal personal writing, bug, folks, job, kid, boss, get across, right? So the formal is more, you know, something that we, we'd probably use um, in a setting that required us to have that sort of air of, I don't know, air of formality, but then I hate defining a word by using the same word. I don't know. Um, and then this is just conversational again, right? It's colloquial, familiar. It doesn't feel like it's inflated in any sort of way. Uh, you are outside of yo damn mind. Tom Cruisen, you cracked. This is slang, which is highly informal. Uh, he's crazy, which is informal, right? And then he's schizophrenic or insane, which that is, that's a formal, that's probably the most formal uh, way that we could uh, call out somebody's mental state. So again, this is just examples of highly informal or slang. Then we have formal, we have informal, and then we have formal. Let's take in another step, colloquial or conversational language. And then here I put dialect and then I put, is there dialect? Uh, we're not gonna get into that today, right? But dialect is often regional. Uh, we, we classify certain methods, uh, we classify certain um, versions of languages as being dialect because they're a deviation from the standard. Um, we're not going to get into all this today, but maybe someday we will. Um, slang, again, is that highly informal uh, language, not appropriate for most writing, but everything is appropriate for poetry, so we're good. Jargon, a special language, uh, the special language of a profession or group. So a lot of times, lawyer or teacher talk, medical terminology, uh, yeah, definitely med medical terminology or um, law has a lot of jargon associated with it. Sciences have a lot of jargon associated with it. But this is just sort of field-specific language, right, um, where we're not going to come across it very often. And, you know, even though I think it'd be really cool if you read a poem with medical jargon, it's also something that would we don't see as often in in poetry, right, or in art as as much. Ways to characterize diction. General, we have look, right, but then we can be more specific with our with what what type of look: gaze, stare, ear, ogle, right. Where gaze is sort of, for me, when I hear the word gaze, I think about like staring in reverence or sort of um, awed by something. I gazed at him as he entered the room, you know, that I, I'm, I'm one, I, there's like a longing of connection. Stare, you know, I have a tendency to stare at people who are irritating me, right? You get the irritated stare, the teacher look is what some people have told me that I have. Peer, it's kind of like, for me, I want to look but not be seen yeah. looking or to ogle. Sorry, that was my husky in the background. Atticus, come here. Come here, baby. No, you're not going to come. Come here. Addy, come here. He's being real grumpy right now. I'll let you meet him in our next lecture. Um, but when we ogle something, we're like eyeballing it, right? We're checking it out. Um, men have a tendency to ogle women, if that makes sense. And so then I've given you a bunch of different sorts of general ways of saying it with then other synonyms that are slightly more specific, right? Right. 
The dishes fell on the floor with a loud noise, crashed or clattered. He walked along slowly, ambled, sauntered. He sauntered. Oh, I wish I sauntered. I said, I wish I glided too. I don't glide. There's a, again, when I heard the learned astronomer, I just, I always go back to that poem for some reason. I, I wandered off by myself until rising and gliding out. That was it. Until rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself. And every time I read that line, I, until rising and gliding, I, I'm like, man, I wish I could glide, but I can't, I can't. I very much walk, you know, and it's a heavy walk. Uh, so again, you know, we go back to that same sensation. What's the difference between the right word and the wrong word? It's the difference between lightning and the lightning bug that we can always sort of find what we're looking for and find a way of making it more, more direct, more, more concrete, if that's what we're wanting to do in our work. We'll skip that. Denotation, right? So denotation is the literal definition of a word or meaning of a word in contrast to the feelings or ideas that the word suggests, right? So the the denotation is just what we would look up in the dictionary. That's the, the meaning, specific meaning of that word. And then connotation. <laughs> So connotation is all the ideas or feelings that the word invokes in addition to its literal and primary meaning, right? The word discipline has an unhappy connotation of punishment and repression, right? Um, connotations for, uh, I don't know. It, it's just all the different things that are associated with what the meaning of the word could be, right? Or how we feel. Something that I do a lot with my classes, I ask them to write down the definition of America. I'm not gonna do that with you today or whenever you're watching this, I don't know, whatever day it is. I'm not gonna do that with you um, in, in this class, but it's interesting to see that very few students actually define America by what we would see in the dictionary. Instead, they list all these different sorts of connotations that America has. Freedom, uh, land of equality, land of oppression, um, you know, all these different sorts of uh, connotations that we can definitely associate with America, but not necessarily the definition of America. Uh, we, you can look at that on your own. Euphonious pleasant sounding, cacophonous is harsh sounding. There are a lot loud songs, bang and grated nerves and of the wretched listeners, pus, pee, maggot. But those are all harsh sounding words, both in the way that they sound when we're, they're spoken, but also, you know, in, in the way that we uh, relate to them banging and grated nerves of the wretched listener, a uh, liquid infection, twink tinkle, butterfly, uh, through the drizzling rain in the steamy street breaks the morning sun. Ah, syntax, we have juxtaposition and a juxtaposition is a poetic or rhetorical device in which normally unassociated ideas, words, or phrases are placed next to one another, creating an effect of surprise, right? Um, jumbo shrimp. Uh, T.S. Eliot does this a lot in his um, poem, The Hollow Man, between the act and the sensation falls the shadow, right? Where he's using these all these sorts of juxtaposition to, to create the sense of, it creates a sense of instability and anxiety almost, right? Because we're relating to things that are seemingly completely unrelated uh, to create that sense of between almost. 
We went over repetition, rhetorical question is a question what each expects no answer used to draw attention to a point and is usually stronger than a direct statement. Um, students are really familiar with this. Please do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, we have uh, the Ask My Professor discussion, which is uploaded to your D2L shell. So this is sort of the equivalent of raising your hand in class, right? So if you need anything or if you're confused on anything, please feel free to just ask a question in there and I will be sure to give you an answer as soon as possible. Uh, have a great day. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Write some poems and just keep killing it, y'all. Bye.